Um, I would like us to, to start with today's session. I am going to switch off uh, my video just so that we can manage your bandwidth and uh, you don't lose um, um, network. Um, we will start now. Just remember that I'm going to uh, mute everyone. Unfortunately, you won't be able to unmute yourself <coughs> um, during um, 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 the lecture. However, towards the end of the lecture, I will then give you an opportunity um, to, 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 to make comments, raise your hand, and so on. In the meantime, use the chat box. Remember, it's the same as any as many messaging systems. You just type in, and then immediately after the presentation, we will then um, have um, that discussion. Right. So today's topic, uh, just for us to start, is uh, <clears throat> we are going to look into ART initiation. Um, and uh, we will focus on a case of Mary. And then towards the end of the session, we will then have a question and answer um, session. So <clears throat> Mary is a 47 year old female who presents to you. She is HIV infected. She weighs 33 kgs. Her CD4 count is 55 cells. She does not have active TB. She was diagnosed five weeks ago um, 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 with, uh, I mean, she was discharged five weeks ago after being treated uh, for cryptococcal meningitis, right? So you are seeing her five weeks after discharge. Uh, she was admitted for cryptococcus uh, meningitis. So is this patient eligible for ARVs? And this is where it starts because if you fail to identify patients who are eligible to be eligible for ART, it means you will probably limit access um, um, to, to ARVs, right? So let's look at what the South African eligibility criteria say. So eligibility criteria in South Africa has been reduced to one sentence, which is universal test and treat. And what this means is that every patient who is tested for HIV and they test positive, by, by virtue of testing positive, you are therefore eligible for ARVs, right? Previously, eligibility criteria, we used to wait for the CD4 count to drop below 200, then it was improved to 350, then 500. In today's world, we do not consider, we do not look um, at a CD4 count to determine who is eligible for, for, for ARVs. Um, we also do not use um, the clinical presentation. Yes, she had cryptococcal meningitis. We might presume that she's got um, significant immunosuppression. However, in today's world, in terms of who qualifies and who doesn't qualify for ARVs, um, your clinical stage or the way you present clinically does not determine. The only thing that determines eligibility um, is your HIV status. So if she's HIV positive, she qualifies. As to whether she is someone we can start today on ARVs or next week or a month later, yes. There we look at the clinical picture and how the patient presents. But if I ask you a simple question, does she qualify for ARVs? Your answer is yes. Why? Because she is living with HIV um, and AIDS, right? So um, it's the same case, Mary, uh, where her weight is 33 kgs. She has a CD4 count of 55 cells. You know, um, she was discharged um, 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 five weeks ago after being treated for cryptococcal meningitis. So there is a question there um, which talks to what is her clinical stage, right? So I would like you to, to to then um, 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 consider this. Please uh, forget the last option, focus on the first four options. What is her WHO clinical stage, right? Uh, please try to make your selection. We need the majority of us to really participate so that uh, we, it can be a great um, 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 learning point. All right, I'm going to stop the voting in the next five seconds. Five, four, 
three, two must remember this thing is anonymous. I won't be able to see who selected um, um, which component, right? So um, these are your results. Um, around 3% of you said stage one, and then 6% said stage two, and then a third, which is 33%, said stage uh, three, and then the majority, which is 58%, um, said stage four, right? So we're going to um, look into that, and then hopefully this will put the, uh, uh, the context into, into this uh, discussion, right? So if you look at the staging, right, we stage patients clinically. So WHO staging is a clinical um, um, staging. We rely on how patients present clinically, and it is based on certain um, um, signs that the patient might have, but also some diagnosis that they might have. So when we say a patient is stage one, we're talking about someone who is HIV positive, but they do not present with symptoms. They are healthy, they are okay, no complaints, right? Some of those patients might present with persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. So these are swollen, small glands, mobile, uh, that are symmetrical, you know, um, all over the body. So if they have that, we would classify them as stage one, right? Some patients would present with stage two conditions where they start to lose weight, but the weight loss is uh, less than 10% of the body weight. They can present with recurrent, you know, sinusitis, uh, tonsillitis, even, you know, ear infections. Um, you also have happy zoster, uh, which is shingles, angular chalitis, which is the white patches on the corners of your mouth due to candida, you know, and then mainly and the, some of the skin conditions such as seborrheic dermatitis um, and so on. Um, if they start to become significantly immunocompromised, we then talk about patients who present with stage three conditions where we have a, a weight loss more than 10%. Now they are very, you know, sick, losing significant weight uh, diarrhea for more than a month, fever for, for more than a month, oral source, oral candida, uh, pulmonary TB. So pulmonary TB is a stage three condition. However, extra pulmonary TB becomes a stage four um, condition, unexplained um, anemia. Some of the severe bacterial infections, uh, bacterial pneumonia, you know, bacterial meningitis, right? Not TB meningitis, because TB meningitis would be regarded as extra pulmonary TB. Therefore, it would be a stage four um, condition, right? So we've got stage one, stage two, stage three. And if things are not getting better, um, now we've got um, stage four conditions. You can see these are very serious conditions, generally called AIDS defining condition. So if someone is HIV positive and they present with this condition, that's when we can really say they have severe immunosuppression and we believe that they might be having um, AIDS, right? Um, so you can see cancers like Kaposi sarcoma, uh, PCP pneumonia, PJP pneumonia, uh, one of the pneumonias we prevent by giving um, cotrimoxazole or Bactrim prophylaxis extra pulmonary TB, not only have they lost weight, but they've lost their lean body mass, which is the muscles. So they don't, they don't have fat, they don't have muscles. All you see is bones, right? You've got, um, where's a, a, a lymphoma, primary CNS lymphoma, you know, um, cryptococcosis. Um, sorry about that. Let me stop sharing. Um, I should have stopped sharing a while ago. All right. <clears throat> so you've got uh, cryptococcus there. Um, so cryptococcus, cryptococcus meningitis. Remember our patient was recently treated for cryptococcal meningitis, right? And the patient has never been on ARVs before. Therefore, that staging that they had when they were admitted, yes, they were admitted. And remember, cryptococcus meningitis, you don't treat it uh, for two weeks in the only. So it's two weeks in the hospital, but the treatment is continued for up to a year. So don't be confused by the fact that she was treated and now she's discharged. She still has cryptococcus in her blood. Her immune system is still significantly compromised, right? Therefore, um, um, cryptococcus meningitis, 
uh, whether treated or not, we will then classify her as a stage four um, uh, patient. So if you look at the WHO staging for a patient who had cryptococcal meningitis and has never been on ARVs before, um, this patient would remain a stage four condition. So the correct answer around staging is that um, our patient is a WHO stage four uh, patient. So Mary is stage four. So now we know that she qualifies for ARVs. She is a WHO stage four uh, patient. Then there's a question to say what baseline tests should be done? You know, what assessments and pay attention, it's assessments and tests, right? But uh, I have a question for you, um, which is uh, which of these uh, following tests do you think should be done, you know, as part of a baseline? Um, so it's still the same, Mary. We agreed that she qualifies for ARVs. We agreed that she's a WHO um, stage four patient. Um, so which of these following tests, you may select uh, more than um, one test uh, because uh, you've, we've got more than one answer. So which of these following um, tests um, should be done? Let's all vote, please give it a try. You know, let's get to 100% of us voting. We'll never know what your selection was. Uh, so that then we can um, engage from there. All right, I'm going to stop in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Then we stop the voting. I want to show you um, the results. So 76% said CD4 count and the answer is yes. A CD4 count is part of a baseline test. The patient will get a CD4 count before they start ARVs. And then uh, when they start ARVs and also 12 months later, when they are on ARVs for a year, we would then repeat a CD4 count, right? A creatinine clearance, yes, probably, especially if you think you are going to prescribe tenofovir for your patient. However, if tenofovir is not part of your regimen, creatinine clearance is not required. Viral load, probably not. We no longer do baseline viral loads. When patients start ARVs, they will get their first viral load when they are six months, when they've taken ARVs for at least six months, right? Then we've got a urine creatinine, yes, as a baseline test. We always do it. Dipsticks, you, you never go wrong with a urine dipstick. Then you've got your hepatitis B surface antigen. It's always a good idea to do a baseline um, hepatitis B um, antigen, right? So let's look at the actual um, 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 assessments. So if you look at um, what you need to do when you prepare a patient for art, you need to assess, you know, the patient for treatment readiness, right? Which includes psychosocial aspects. Is the patient ready? Has the patient disclosed to other people? You know, how are they coping? Do they have mental health, you know, um, 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 issues that need to be addressed? Do they have any pre-existing um, opportunistic infections, STIs, you know, TB screening? So, so if they have oral candida, we have to treat opportunistic infections first before we start um, ARVs. Um, TB screening has to be done. You know, we have to do a baseline CD4 count. We have to stage the patient like we have done. And then we need to assess whether our patient qualifies for what we call prophylaxis therapies, right? There's three kinds. We've got cotrimoxazole prophylaxis therapy, which we give to all patients with CD4 counts less than 200. We've got isoniazid prophylaxis therapy, which we give to all patients who have a negative uh, TB screen and we want to prevent TB. So we give them INH 300 milligrams. Cotrimoxazole is cotrimoxazole 960 milligrams daily. And then also fluconazole prophylaxis therapy. And this is important for our patient because remember, we are seeing her five weeks after discharge. Remember that if she had crypto in the hospital, when she's discharged, she's supposed to be 
on fluconazole prophylaxis therapy as an oral drug for at least a year, for a minimum of a year, or until her CD4 count, you know, has went up beyond, I mean, above 200. So this is very important to check with our patient whether they still have, you know, um, um, enough fluconazole uh, prophylaxis. So that's, that's quite um, important, right? So, so, and um, you can see now every visit we have to assess for side effects. If it's a first visit before we start, we have to teach and educate about side effects. We have to do TB screening. We have to teach them about the drugs and how to take them and make sure that every visit we address adherence. We have to educate about the safe sex, uh, how to use condoms, also bringing in sexual partners and children to ensure that they can test that She's a female, right? We have to offer family planning. Uh, so we'll have to do a pregnancy test, at least. Her weight, WHO staging, we said she is stage four. We do a TB screening and assess her if she's eligible for isoniazid prophylaxis therapy, a baseline hepatitis B studies, or you do it anytime if you have to interrupt turn off of her, stop turn off of her from the regimen. A pap smear, she's a female, so if she's not pregnant, we do it. If she's pregnant, we prefer to do it six weeks um, after delivery. A baseline CD4 count, remember I said patients get only two CD4 counts, baseline and at one year, right? That's when they will get um, their CD4 count. A viral load, we don't do a baseline viral load. The first viral load is done six months after the patient has started um, ARVs. Then you've got your HB to assess for anemia, but you only do it for patients who are anemic or those who are going to be taking zidovudin or what we call um, AZT. A creatine clearance for those where we are going to start them on tenofovir. If we were going to prescribe nevirapine, we would then do an ALT. So these four tests, you don't, you don't do all of them. You only do them if the regimen you are planning to prescribe for your child has any um, of these drugs, right? And also pay attention to the follow-up schedule that some tests like a CD4 count, it's six months, one year, and then we you know every year from there, uh, which is a viral load. A CD4 count baseline in 12 months, a creatinine clearance, if you do it, it's baseline three months, you know, 12 months, and then every year. So this is um, quite um, important, right? So, 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 so in terms of the monitoring blood, I think you can see there's like probably 10 things um, that we need to do. Just make sure that you do them. And especially because it's a female, so don't forget the pap smear and a pregnancy test amongst the other things. Uh, urine dipsticks is not included here, but it's important that we, we must do it, right? So we have answered three questions. Is she eligible for ARVs? We said yes, right? Um, what? What is her WHO staging? She is stage four. Why? Because of she had cryptococcal meningitis. Remember, we don't use a CD4 count to determine the WHO staging. So if it was 55, but clinically she was asymptomatic, she had no problems, she would remain WHO stage one. So that is a, a very important to note. Then we discussed the baseline bloods, which include TB screening, creatinine, baseline CD4 count, hepatitis B, um, you know, pregnancy test and a pap smear, you know, and so on. So we'll do all those tests. Now, since we agree that she qualifies for ARVs, what regimen should she start? So what drugs can we start here? And what is the appropriate dose and frequency of each medication, right? So that is the, 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 the big question. So remember, when you start ARVs, you don't just give drugs, right? You have to take proper history. You have to examine your patients. Make sure that you do basic tests like your, your CD4 count, your baseline test. You, have, you want to do your urine dipsticks. You want to make sure that you have a problem list from your patient. You want to educate your patient and you want to give medication. But in giving the medication, there's at least four steps, right? The first step is to say, is uh, our case here, our patient, is it someone we need to give ARVs today or later, right? Now, you see she's got cryptococcal meningitis, for example. When is the right time to initiate ARVs for a patient who's got cryptococcal meningitis? You remember she was discharged five weeks ago. So, so if she has been treated for less than five, six weeks, we know she's at risk of 
um, a condition called iris. If you attended last week's session, you would know what I'm talking about, immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. Generally, we prefer to start patients um, on ARVs, especially those who had crypto when uh, six weeks or more, when the, when the crypto has been treated for six weeks or more. Has she been on ARVs before? Is she a candidate for second line or first line? Well, she has never been on ARVs before, right? So it's first line. If she had taken first line before, stopped or interrupted, we could have considered second line, but she has never been on ARVs before. Then which three drugs must we give her? Some people think tenofovir, some thinking people think lamivudine, evaverin, so we're gonna go through how to choose um, these three drugs. And that is what I want us to look at. So just remember that when it comes to ARVs and NIMAR, there's many drugs there. Remember, this is the HIV life cycle where HIV approaches a white cell count, infects the cell, and then you've got the baby, you know, uh, viruses being produced there, right? So in terms of the key steps of infection, you've got attachment where the virus attaches to the CD4 count. Then the two membranes fuse, which gives us the second stage, which is fusion. You can see the genetic material of the virus being released into the cytoplasm, right? Then this single strand RNA has to be converted into a DNA. So the viral RNA has to be converted into a viral DNA, and that is done by an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, reverse transcriptase. So we've got drugs that inhibit this enzyme. They are called reverse transcriptase inhibitors, right? Like tenofovir is a reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Inhibitor zidovudin, abacave, lamivudin, emtricitabine, right? So those are the drugs that are called reverse transcriptase inhibitors. We've got your nucleoside with one N there. Then you've got your non nucleosides with two N. So your nucleoside, it's like I said, tenofove, lamivudin, abacave. Then you've got your non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, non-nucleoside, that's efavirenz and nevirapine, right? So those are, this is what we call drug classes, right? And then you can see here that double strand DNA is then transported into the nucleus of the cell. It is now integrated into our DNA. So you've got the viral DNA, so the DNA of the virus being inserted or integrated into our DNA as human beings. And the process of integrating the viral DNA with the human DNA is done by an enzyme called integrase inhibitor. I mean, integrase, that's the enzyme, right? But the drugs that block that enzyme, they are called integrase inhibitors. And there's only one that you need to know, it's called dolutegrave. So we need to choose the drugs, right? Then you've got protease, which cuts the long strands of proteins and allows the virus to mature into baby viruses that are able to infect more cells. That process of cutting and maturation is facilitated by an enzyme called protease. So we've got drugs that are called protease inhibitors. And the main one is what we call lopinavir and ritonavir. So those uh, two drugs. I mean, I ran through this very quickly. If you want to learn more about it, it's best that you really go through it uh, through the course, the e-learning. So remember now, in choosing the drugs, right, you always use three drugs. It's a rule. You must always use two nucleosides, right, two nucleosides. Remember here I said there's nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And when you say nucleosides, we mean tenofovir, lamivudine, efavirin, I mean, uh, Tenofovir, abacave, lamivudin, and tricitabine. So you choose two, right? Plus an integrase inhibitor, dolutegrave. So always it's dolutegrave with two nucleosides, right? Or efavirenz, which is a non nucleoside, efavirenz plus two nucleosides, right? Or lopinavir, ritonavir plus two nucleosides. This is a law. You never break this law. You should never have two non nucleosides and one nucleoside or integrase inhibitor with a nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor plus something else. 
It does happen, but it's beyond the minimal scope and you should never find yourself prescribing drugs that do not follow any of this. And our first line regimen in South Africa is based on two nucleosides plus an integrase inhibitor. So that is a very important. And this is how it looks, right? So you've got tenofovir plus lamivudine and your choice of dolutegravir or efavirenz. If you go back, it's two nucleosides, tenofovir plus lamivudine, which is the same here and here, but then you have to choose whether you're going to give dolutegravir or efavirenz, right? Two nucleosides plus a integrase inhibitor or a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So the standard first line regimen in South Africa is tenofovir, lamivudine with dolutegravir. Where dolutegravir cannot be used, we then use efavirenz, right? Where you cannot use abacavir, I mean, so you cannot use tenofovir, you then use abacavir. So just remember, tenofovir is our first line standard drug of choice. However, for patients where there's contraindications to tenofovir, we then want to use um, abacavir. So this is quite um, important. And our second line, for those who fail first line and they need second line, you can see, it's two nucleosides and it's either DTG or lopinavir, ritonavir. So that is quite powerful. And again, this is a chain of events in terms of regimens. Today, we are not dealing with children, right? But you will see that as people grow or uh, yeah, children grow and people grow into adults, then their regimen needs change, right? From this type of a regimen to this regimen here. And as soon as someone crosses a weight of 35 kgs, they then qualify for tenofovir. So you can see even here that if the weight is less than 35, you cannot use tenofovir. You therefore have to use what? Abacavir, lamivudin, and dolutegravir. And if you follow the chain, dolutegravir can only be used if the weight is above 20 kgs. So don't just cram the regimens. You need to know which drug you'll be able to use for what kind of a patient. And you can see here, they say, this regimen, tenofovir, lamivudine with dolutegravir, right? This regimen, you can only prescribe it as is if the weight is above 35 and the age of the patient is above 10 years, right? So you don't use tenofovir in children. If the weight is less than 10 years, I mean, the, the age is less than 10 years and the weight is below 35 kgs, Abacave, Lamivudin, Dolutegrave is the best um, regimen uh, for, your, for, your, for, your, for your patient, right? And these are the drugs. You can see Tenofovir, if you are to prescribe it, it's 300 milligrams daily, but you must monitor the kidney functioning of your patient uh, in doing your creatinine and creatinine clearance. Abacave, 600 milligrams daily, usually no problems. Lamivudine, 300 milligrams daily, usually no problem. So obviously here we have to decide. Lamivudine will always be in the regimen. It's a question of whether we'll use tenofovir or abacavir. So if there are no contraindications to tenofovir, we give tenofovir. If there's a, a contraindication to the use of tenofovir, we then shift to prescribe um, abacavir, right? Then we choose between efavirenz and dolutegravir, right? If you look at dolutegravir, it's 50 milligrams daily. However, we must avoid it in the first trimester, also in patients who are not on reliable contraception. So if our case lady tells us that no, she doesn't want, or she's planning to have a baby in the next six months, it's probably not uh, recommended to give dolutegravir as much as dolutegravir is a good drug we would then give that patient an um, effavirenz. However, before you give effavirenz, you have to check if your patient does not have active psychiatric illness, right? Where you cannot give both effavirenz and dolutegravir, you've got your option to use either nevirapine or lopinavir, ritonavir. So this is um, quite um, important, right? So tenofovir, again, remember, it's a 300 milligram daily tablet. It is our preferred drug. However, we cannot give it if the weight is below 35 kgs or if the age of the patient is less than 10 years, right? 
but also if the patient has uh, some renal problems with low creatinine clearances, we want to avoid the use of tenofovir. So that is how we would deal with it. Dolutegrave, like I said, it's an integrase inhibitor. It's a 50 milligrams per hour daily, right? Remember to avoid it where possible in the, in the especially in the first six weeks um, um, of pregnancy. Um, also, there's a other drug drug interactions like your anti acids and your your anti convulsants. So you need to pay attention um, to that. If you cannot give it either because of its early pregnancy or some of these drug drug interaction, then you'll opt for efavirenz. So remember, these drugs are not absolute. All of them they have uh, elements where you need to avoid them. So efavirenz, like I said, it's 600 milligrams nocte. Um, and also, the other thing which I didn't include about effavirenz here is the dose, right? For you to give a dose of 600 milligrams nocte of effavirenz, the weight has to be more than 40 kgs. If the weight is below 40 kgs, then this dose is too high. You have to then cut it to 400 milligrams, right? So always pay attention um, to these drugs and, and, and what are the things that you need to really pay attention to. So remember the favorite dose, you only give the full dose if the weight is above 400 milligrams. So also we recommend fixed dose uh, combinations. So the first fixed dose combination, which most patients will get is tenofovir with lamivudin and dolutegravir, right? But you cannot just give it, you need to make sure that there are no contraindications to dolutegravir and that there are no contraindications to turn off of it. And what are you checking for? Is that the patient have kidney problems? Is the weight, you know, above um, 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 35 kgs, which then you are happy? Is the patient older than 10 years? Then you can give it, right? Here with the Lutegrave, if it's in the first trimester, especially the first six weeks, you want to avoid the use of the drug, you know, for now. Where you cannot use tenofovir, right? Let's say there's a problem that the uh, tenofovir now is contraindicated. You would then go for abacave, right? If you don't have abacave, then you go to zidovudine. So that is the chain: tenofovir to abacave, then to zidovudine, right? Where you cannot use dolutegrave, you can see you can still use. Um, effavirenz. But we always prefer what we call fixed dose combination because it means we minimize the number of tablets that our patient, you know, um, needs to take. So as much as possible. But remember, if you are going to interrupt tenofovir, you are not going to be able to give one tap once day. Probably you'll give um, a bacave with lamivudine, which is one tablet, right? And then you give the separately, which is then two tablets. But it's still better than what we, we used to, 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 to do before. So, so, so that is um, um, quite um, useful. So let's come back to the regimen. So if you look at the profile of our patient, firstly, it's a female. Um, we need to verify whether she's pregnant or not. So if a pregnancy test is negative, you know, which is good because we don't want people with low CD4 counts to be pregnant. Then we have to assess whether she has plans to fall pregnant and then if she's willing to be on a reliable contraception. If she says yes, we share the benefits of both the Lutegrave and the effavirenz. And then uh, we say, well, we recommend the Lutegrave. Hopefully she agrees to be on the Lutegrave. So the Lutegrave is in, Lamivudin is in. Then we have to discuss whether uh, there's contraindications to turn off of her. She doesn't have, seem to have uh, kidney problems, so that is fine. However, look at this weight, right? The weight here is 33 kgs. Let me take you back to this diagram here. Her weight is 33 kgs. Her weight is below 35 kgs, below this side, right? If it was above 35 kgs, she will be getting this regimen here. Her weight is below 35 kgs, therefore we cannot use tenofovir. We will then use abacave with lamivudin and dolutegrave if she's on a reliable contraception and she's not pregnant uh, or early pregnant. If there's contraindications to dolutegrave, we will then give her abacave, lamivudin, and effavirenz. But looking at the case and how she has presented the, 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 the regimen, the best regimen for her at this 
point in time. Based on the information we have here, will be Abakave, Lamivudin, and Dolutegrave. Two nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, two NRTIs, and that is Abakave and Lamivudin. And then we choose um, um, the, the third drug, which is Dolutegrave. So remember, going back a bit, that your regimen should always follow these rules. Two nucleosides plus an integrase inhibitor. So with two nucleosides, we used Abakave and Lamibudin plus an integrase inhibitor, which is Dolutegrave. If we couldn't use Dolutegrave, we would then give a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, which would have been a favorite. Right. So I'm hoping um, you are following there. So then they say here, which opportunistic prophylaxis do you offer this patient? Does she qualify? Yes, so her CD4 count is 50, right? It's below, so remember, for someone to qualify for cotrimoxazole prophylaxis, either you have a CD4 count less than 200, which she has, her CD4 count is 50, or you are WHO stage two, stage three, stage four, and she is stage four because she had cryptococcus meningitis. So yes, she qualifies for cotrimoxazole, 960 milligrams per hour daily, right? Then the question is, does she qualify for TB preventative therapy? Can we give her drugs that can help her not to get TB? Yes, why? Because we will screen her for TB. If she does not have uh, symptoms or signs of TB, we assess if she has contraindications to isoniazid like rash, painful feet. If she doesn't have, then she qualifies for isoniazid. 300 milligrams per hour daily for 12 months, right? For a year. Now, fluconazole prophylaxis, she does qualify for it. Why? Because she has been discharged uh, with a, a cryptococcus meningitis. When, the, when a patient with crypto, remember we treat crypto in the hospital for two weeks, right? Then we discharge them with a fluconazole 400 milligrams daily, you know? And then later on, we change it to 200 milligrams daily, but they have to continue it for at least um, a year. And this is the algorithm. So it says here, when a patient um, is HIV positive and they have a crack antigen, that's less than 100. I mean, they have a CD4 count, sorry, less than 100. We have to do a crack antigen, right? Crack antigen, we have to do it. If it comes back positive, number one, we call the patient to come back we want to screen the patient for meningitis in yellow there. We are looking for headache and confusion. And then you want to check if there's any contraindication to the use of fluconazole, right? If uh, once you have done this, you are checking, is your patient asymptomatic or not? This one, symptomatic, you give fluconazole, six tablets that you refer the patient to the hospital. They, they diagnose her to be having cryptococcus meningitis they treat her for two weeks, then she's discharged, you see. So on discharge, she's on fluconazole, 400 milligrams daily for two months. Then after two months, you reduce the dose to 200 milligrams for at least a year, right? You will continue it at least until her CD4 count is above 200. And when do you start ARVs? Do you see? Only if she has received treatment for, for cryptococcus meningitis for at least four to six weeks, right? Which in our case, remember she was admitted for two weeks. Now you are seeing her five weeks after discharge. So she's been seven weeks um, um, on antifungal therapy. So she does qualify for us to give her um, ARVs. But please don't be in a hurry to start patients who were admitted with crypto on ARVs because it takes time to clear the crypto in the CSF and they can come back um, with uh, an exaggerated inflammatory response and, and headaches and so on, right? Um, the other group is patients <clears throat> who have low CD4 counts where the crack antigen comes back positive. They do not have uh, symptoms. So these ones, we give them the, the, the prophylaxis by starting them on 800 milligrams daily for two weeks, then 400 milligrams for two months, then 200 milligrams for up to a year. Right. I hope you are taking a picture of this slide because if you are studying with us, Nimart, there's a question on this one and you have to know how to prescribe fluconazole prophylaxis. It's a requirement. And if you are looking for a job, 
they will ask you about it. And if you don't know it, can't get a job, eh? can't get a promotion. This is a standard. This is a like basic, basic prophylaxis. So remember, there's three kinds of prophylaxis therapies. One prevents pneumonia like uh, illnesses, PCP. This one prevents TB. And this one is meant to prevent cryptococcal meningitis. These three conditions collectively, they contribute to significant mortality if we are not if issuing these prophylaxis therapies in addition to ARVs um, to our patients, right? So is the same uh, a patient of ours. How would you monitor if her ARVs um, are working? So how do we monitor success? Remember, there's monitoring for toxicity where we do your creatinines, but how do you monitor whether the ARVs are working or not? With, what is the single test that tells you if ARVs are working or not? I should have put that question here for voting here yeah? so that I can hear, but it's one test. It's a viral load, right? It's a viral load. The only test that will tell you if ARVs are working or not is not a creatinine, it's not a CD4 count, it's not this and that. It's a viral load. So the viral load is the recommended method, right, of monitoring patients if you want to tell if ARVs are working or not. We do the first viral load. Remember, I, I explained when patients have taken ARVs for six months, you do the first viral load. Then the second viral load is at 12 months when they are on ARVs for 12 months. Then you repeat it once a year, you know, um, from, from then onwards. So just remember that we use a viral load and not a CD4 count for monitoring uh, treatment. And then when we say a patient has failed treatment, we mean someone who's got a viral load above a thousand on two consecutive occasions. And these viral loads, these two viral loads are taken three months apart. So you have the first high viral load, you do your adherence, you solve problems with your patient, you repeat it after three months. If, you, if the two viral loads are still up, then you say your patient has failed treatment. So how do you monitor treatment success, whether ARVs are working or not, by ensuring that you do a viral load when patients have taken a treatment for at least six months? We are talking non-pregnant patients. In pregnancy, we use different uh, protocols. So just remember how you interpret your viral load results. So if you do your six months viral load and it comes back as less than 50, we are happy. We buy a cake for our patient. We say, yay, you are doing well then you do adherence and then we repeat it again during the 12 months visit. If the viral load comes back, it's high, but it's between 50 and 1,000. It has not crossed 1,000. We do adherence and we repeat it in three months and then we take a decision. If the viral load is now um, more than 1,000, we need to repeat it in three months time and then we take um, that decision, right? Now, this is the last scenario for the night. So here's Mary. Uh, which we, we've been dealing with. So, so she's, she's got a weight of 33, CD4 count is 55. She does not have active TB. She was treated with cryptococcal meningitis and initiated on ARVs five weeks after discharge from the hospital. That's when we started her on ARVs. Today she presents to you, she's complaining of body pains and high temperature, right? Uh, 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 she also has a headache, but there's no confusion. Yeah? You started her own ARVs, she's coming back. Remember with crypto, when she was diagnosed, before she was admitted, she had a headache, right? Then she was treated in the hospital. She came to you, she was stable. There was no headache. You started her own ARVs. Now she's back, you know, a few days, few weeks later. She said, hey, the headache is back. So what do you suspect is happening and how will you approach the management of this patient? Yeah? What, do you, what do you suspect? Well, you can suspect many things. You can suspect that she's sick. Maybe she's got another infection. Maybe crypto is back. Maybe it's an adverse event from the drugs. You know, you could suspect quite a number of things and it's your responsibility as a clinician to then take proper history, make a proper assessment of this patient and then make the right um, diagnosis. But I want to revise uh, in summary what we discussed last week when we discussed immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. We said we have two types of irises, right? We have an iris where a patient is not um, on art 
the patient does not have any, you assess them, you take it through, you examine them, you find nothing. There's no clinical anything. The patient does not have symptoms of anything, right? And uh, hopefully if you, did, if you had waited maybe for a year, they would have developed some condition later on, whether it's TB or crypto. So what usually happens is that you have a patient, again, who comes in, you take proper history, you do TB screening, you examine them, you find nothing. Then you start them on ARVs there, right? Because it's a stable patient. Then they come back now with fever, headaches, and body pains. And you're like, oh, you have unmasked, right? A condition which was there, but it was preclinical. The patient was not presenting with symptoms. So you have unmasked. Remember, there was a mask. The condition is there, but it was hidden, right? You gave ARVs, ARVs removes the mask, then a patient now is symptomatic. And remember last week we discussed that um, AR, uh, uh, ARVs and iris are a good thing because iris tells us that the treatment is actually working. So that is very important for us to know that, oh, the treatment is working. So iris is a good thing. I say, sad, we are not afraid. So when patients develop this condition here, we have to investigate this condition, do the necessary tests and, and, and collect sputums and whatever tests we need to do, confirm the diagnosis, treat it, right? If there's an exager exaggerated inflammation, we then manage that inflammatory response. So that is uh, very important. And then here's another one, paradoxical iris, the opposite. So there is unmasking where we didn't know there was no diagnosis. We started ARVs and something appeared. Then there's this one here, right? A patient with a known, like in our case, uh, our patient had cryptococcus meningitis. It was diagnosed, right? The patient was started on treatment for crypto in the hospital. The symptoms disappeared, right? He was even discharged. She was now on a maintenance phase on fluconazole, maybe 200 milligrams per hour daily. So the patient was doing okay, right? What did we do, me and you? We started the patient on ARVs, right? Now the symptoms are back. She's back. She says, oh, my body is so, he's got fever and then he's got a headache, right? So it's some form of iris. And this iris, this immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, we call it paradoxical. Why? Because the opposite of what uh, was supposed to happen is actually happening. So to revise, you've got unmasking iris, which happens when? Right? When does it happen? Mm -hmm. I hope you have an answer for me. A patient who's got a preclinical opportunistic infection that presents after starting ARVs. Then you've got another one right here, right? A patient who has got a known diagnosis like crypto, they were admitted, they were treated, symptoms disappeared, you started ARVs and the symptoms are back, right? So how do you approach? So let me ask you a question as we close our topic for today. I hope you are ready for this one. It's a last, last question for today. So in terms of our case study, let me go back to that case study there. Yes, in terms of this, which one does she have? Which one does she have? Which one, which one? Remember, Remember, read carefully. Remember, the diagnosis was known. It's not a new diagnosis, right? The diagnosis was known, right? The diagnosis was known. It's still possible that it's something else not linked to crypto, but the probability that it's crypto is still very high. Right, okay. Hey, let me show you your results. So I know it's confusing. We will keep on uh, hammering on this issue, you know, on a week by week basis. Around 23% said it's unmasking and the other 77% said it's paradoxical. So I will repeat it for you, you know, and say, remember <clears throat> this patient of ours uh, uh, had a diagnosis, crypto. She was treated. Symptoms disappeared. 
started on ARVs. And now what has happened? The symptoms are back. So that is paradoxical. The opposite of what we expected is happening, right? This is definitely not um, um, unmasking. Unless if when we investigate, we're going to find that it is the condition that she's presenting with, maybe it's TB rather than crypto. So it, she didn't have it before. Then it might be unmasking. But based on how she presents with a headache, it's probably paradoxical iris. And remember, with paradoxical iris, you always have to exclude other things, whether the treatment, is she still taking treatment? Is she heart here? Is this not a drug at this event? Once you have excluded all these things, drug-drug interactions and so on, then you say it's paradoxical iris. At the nest level, NEMART level, when you suspect iris from cryptococcus meningitis, you have to refer the patient to be seen by a doctor at the hospital. You are not going to manage this patient in your clinic. So that is very, very um, important and key. Right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope um, today's session was um, worth your time and uh, you have managed, you know, to grasp something and to discuss. We will share um, the recording and uh, yeah, I appreciate your time.